Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights, here with Ryan Staczynski, the founder and kind of the main man for Gem Rate, which is uh, increasingly popular. I'm really enjoying drawing inference from some of the numbers he's gathering from the pop reports, mainly of PSA, but he's moving into BGS as well as SGC and perhaps others. So he, he grabs the data and uh, kind of puts it together and uh, puts it in a, in a usable form where we can see uh, what's going on. So thanks, Ryan, for your uh, applying your expertise to our hobby. Thanks, sponsors, Tops Panini and Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, Hugs and Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Card, Burbank Sports Cards, ComC.com, and Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication. So thanks, Ryan, and keep up the good work. Here's our discussion. Okay, you have your all-time grading stats. Were those numbers given to you by SGC and BGS, or did you... It's all through pop reports. Yeah. So I just did okay. a one time pool of the pop reports. Yep. Okay. So there's nuance there that I may not be aware of, but as far as what they're publicly showcasing, that's right. the way that I present it. Okay. And uh, the other thing that was that was curious to me is I just try to have sports card insight here, but the numbers suggest that, again, barring for the fact that PSA started first, and so they had a, a big lead on the others, millions, but not tens of millions of cards graded in those early years when they were the only game in town, a few million maybe. But it looks like 70%, like out of 10 cards, seven are PSA, mm-hmm. two are PGS, and one is SGC. Now, the mix right. is different. PSA has a cross-the-board mix. They grade everything. BGS, considerably stronger on the newer stuff. SGC, considerably stronger on the old stuff. In yep. your first pass at it, you've got their gem rates, I think, reflecting that more so than the strictness of grading. Are, are you doing footnotes or things to point out that, or, or is that not included in your service at this point? No, that is. So I ended up doing a second breakout around and I published it to Instagram around how that broke out by era to help just bring to light a little bit of that nuance. And because that's exactly what it is. I didn't realize how well received that was going to be and how much people would use that in the different ways that they did. And so I needed to quickly go out to market with another sort of clarification on it. And I'm going to continue to do it because I think it's really interesting data that nobody's really been able to surface. So it's the first time it's been brought to market like this, but I don't want to leave too much out there for people to assume and run with without a little bit more color or context. So Yes, it's, it was a little bit of a vague report to start. And I'm going to try to add more da- add more data to support it. But but one of your revenue models could be that when you put out your year in review, your monthly, quarterly reports, whatever, I, I believe there would be interest from people who would want you to dig deeper and do a custom report. And mm-hmm. it, it would start out, Ryan, as a one-off. But if it was something that made sense, you could commercialize that later. But it, you, you get somebody to pay to do the development, to do those gem rates by era, by decade, by whatever, by company even, because you probably can parse the data. You have all that in the data, I would think. Yeah, I haven't really touched on it, but this is one of the most, I think of it as one of the most powerful databases in the industry in the sense that I've not only you know pulled this data in, I've modeled it and structured it. I've spent many months making sure that it's easily queried in SQL and it sits in a data warehouse. And I can do like the Elias Sports Bureau types of analyses. I, I totally get that. And you have quasi permission from them as long as you're not making any money. But did you have nomenclature resolution issues? We had that when we were doing some of our arrangement with uh, eBay. We had the rights to their sales data. But on the other hand, it was gobbledygook in many cases. Yeah. So to what extent, even in basketball, PSA lists their basketball different than BGS does in terms of the, the years. How are you pulling that together? Yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. So right now I present the data as is from each of the different grading companies. And then there's certain ways, like I can group stuff by player and stuff that's unique that I think doesn't require factoring what you just said. But yes, that's probably my biggest problem to solve is can I find some sort of uh, taxonomy that sort of allows me to group everything that's, you can know, you can generically query 2019 Prism and then see the three different results from the different grading companies because everybody has their own style. So yeah. I'm, I learned quickly and I'm still figuring out what the plan of attack is for that. We had that. Actually, I think it was a worse problem because we had eBay that had no standardization. At least you have internal standardization within each grading company. Your gem rate for BGS and SGC, does that include 9.5 and above? Yep. Because that wasn't clear to me, but I was thinking it probably was. Yeah. And the second report that I put out, because I got a lot of questions about that, I, I started to call that out. I did include it. It's such a small percentage of the numbers that I didn't. I didn't feel the need to call it out an issue, but yeah, I had enough questions where I did. And then I'm actually going to publish a report that's just like, I had a lot of people ask me, what's the BGS, pristine and black label percentages and what is SGC's gold label percentage? And so I know that. So I'll publish that stuff too, because I think that'll be interesting. Now, I'm not saying BGS is a pre-grading service, but there are people that send it into BGS 
they get the 9.5, but if it has bad subgrades, they leave it alone. If it has great subgrades, they'll try to cross it over. Now, if they get a 10 BGS, they're cooking. And that's just great. So I think your followers are going to want to know, not just mm-hmm. the gem rate, but the pristine rate and the black or gold rate too. And that's valuable information. Again, I think you have the opportunity for either a custom service or a premium patron type service, where if people pay some, they get the free data, but they want to pay a little bit more, they get further breakdowns. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing I noticed, and I think this is true, but are, are you saying that Michael Jordan is the most graded player in history so far? And yep. Ken Griffey Jr. is second? I can't remember if Ken Griffey Jr. is second, but Michael Jordan is the most graded. Yep. I'm pretty sure Michael Jordan's first, and I, I would guess that Griffey, he was by a pre, he was by a pretty decent margin too, yes, if I remember yes, correctly. Yes. The other thing I was shocked at is that Luca and Ja are neck and neck. Yeah, and, and Luca's been around one more year, but I think production went up in Ja and Zion's year. That was that's the most graded every year. I, I guess they're setting new records. Since I started collecting the data, Ja has actually been higher than Zion, which I think would surprise people. And it's partially just because Ja was maybe a more of a fringe grade and you would maybe send him in a slower service. But yes, to your point, oh, just the supply increased. And then Ja was in that sweet spot of people were holding on to it, but not necessarily doing express. And when grading was a key way to extract value, Ja was one of the focal points. If one of these other grading companies asked you to be a part of the, your service, would you tell them, hey, after I see a million cards in your pop reports, I will include you. Would there be a, a volume thing or some relative level of acceptance? Because we've got some other people entering this arena that are going to have a pop. If it's if they've got 100,000 cards graded in their lifetime, that may not be worth it. I, I had actually debated adding HGA because their data was pretty easy to work with. And the reason I didn't was actually because they've run into some integrity problems with their pop report. And so I just didn't want to make it available when I know they themselves have said it's not necessarily like the best data set. And it may have since been approved, but this was over the summer where I had conversations with them. So I'd be willing to entertain it as long as there's a certain degree of confidence that this data is accurate. And I think I'd still try to be somewhat selective. But yes, I think to not make it too arbitrary, I'd probably have to put some threshold in place where it's to qualify, you have to have some minimum as well. Because otherwise, again, it wouldn't be me, but somebody would unscrupulously start a grading service and intentionally do lots of nines. Mm-hmm. So their mint rate would be really strong, but their gem mint rate would be really low. So it would look like they're the toughest on the other hand, but again, gaming the system. But if if you make them wait a little while, prove their metal, gain acceptance and see what they're doing, then you're in a situation where you can, with confidence, report it to your readers. But it seemed like CSG having a, a parent company that's been doing grading for a long time, they've probably got their act together pretty well, but they probably haven't graded that many cards yet. Yeah, I think that I can't remember too. One of the, I think it might've been CSG. I don't even know if they had a pop report available or if it was accessible the way that I wanted, but I'd like to bring somebody that's established like that on board for sure. That's like an ideal. And again, I think it's useful for them to just be in a conversation. So I think that would be valuable to them, valuable to my audience. So yes, I'd like to bring them on, especially if they have credibility that's already been established to some degree. I've done a disservice to anybody who does vintage because I'm only showcasing gem rates. And I'm doing that intentionally to eliminate noise and to just make it very clear, like where the focus is on the surface. But I have all the data. I just don't disclose it. And I'm just wondering if there's other things I should be doing to make this more appealing to an investor or a collector who is not just focused on ultra modern, where this data set tends to like service the audience the best right now. So I'm wondering like things that I could do or how I should think about presenting vintage data through this lens. Good question. But the better question is, what does that vintage collector want? You're trying to figure right. out what they want. I think if you had a custom service, they may want to know some consolidation of pop reports with specificity for who's grading it, what year it is. And further, they're really going to want to know when the early BGS, mm-hmm. the early PSA, that matters. They're doing it by serial number now. You'd be doing it by pop report and reconstructing whether PSA has gotten tougher because the submission mix is different or BGS. Mm-hmm. But I think BGS, again, I was there. I think there was a conscious effort to be strict in the beginning, to be serious. Mm-hmm. And so the early pop report cards for BGS, there are people who just buy them and 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 crack them and, and right. send them in to get a, a, a bump on the grade. So I think vintage is problematic. Mm-hmm. Because it's problematic, there could be an opportunity for you that could not be simply presented. It almost needs to be custom because it's too much information for people that don't care. But the people right. here, they're looking for an edge, Ryan, and you could give them that edge. And they'd rather know that they're the one that has the edge 
and nobody else, or they have a head start. Maybe they yeah. get like a patron. They get the early warning of here's the report. And then and at the end of the month, I'm going to release it. Okay. Yeah. There's some interesting things too on that front that I've thought about creating accounts and building in alerts as one element of this, just to let people know and flag when certain elements are graded. Because I've come through this painstaking process of collecting this data daily, which is expensive, but I want to know on a specific day when a card appears in the pop report. And I don't want to know it on a weekly cadence or a monthly cadence. I want to know it on the day. So I know some specifics about it. So I think there's some interesting things there. And then the content side of things, early looks or sneak peeks at stuff, I think is super interesting. Windowing some stuff ahead of time, I think is interesting. I think there's definitely opportunities there. And I do think the whole custom element of this that you're mentioning is huge. I don't have the bandwidth to do it, but I am getting so many custom requests and I want to embrace all of them because I think they're super interesting. And I think like even you and I, I think we could sit with this database and workshop. Do not embrace all of them. You need to embrace the ones that make sense. The customer's not always right. There's some oddball right, out there right. that wants something. You're going to be on a wild goose chase, but there's going to be enough nuggets in there for you to chase that I think you could build something really Yeah, cool. I appreciate that. I had lots You're... of people sending me suggestions and they weren't terrible, but you just got to draw a line somewhere sometimes. At the peak, we had 18 guys doing what you're doing, I think, of trying to meaningfully synthesize the data. It wasn't just pop reports. It was all sales, but the, the principle is similar. It's tough. It's actually one of the ideas I've had, and I'd love your thoughts on this given the media business, um, is potentially even licensing this to you know content creators themselves. And I don't know what that would look like, but I know this is a trove of content that hasn't been discussed in the hobby and there's so many different ways. So not only for collectors and investors, but also just people who want to tell interesting stories about the data. This data is so rich in that, that I can't even, you know, scratch the percentages of making this interesting and bringing it to market. I'm wondering if there's an opportunity to license this data. Again, we start to go into the commercial side of this equation, which then means I need to make sure I'm buttoned up with the graders, but. The licensing is uh, the double-edged sword. It sounds like a good deal, but if PSA was to, ask you to sign a licensing agreement, that's not necessarily a good thing, even if it was for $1. Because then you're in a licensing relationship, which they may choose to not renew, and then you're stuck. So right, right now, you have the quiet, happy acquiescence of them. They're not necessarily looking the other way, but you now have built up some history that they can't lower the boom on you. If they've known what you were doing, they let you do it. But as soon as you go to them and say, hey, I want to get a license, Unless it's very long term, then you can turn off your tap. And the other thing is, once you have a license with somebody else, it's again, I'm giving legal advice without any legal degree, but I was in court a lot, you know, for my expert witnessing. But it's hard for you to license something, it's faulty in that you don't own the property that's being licensed. You're right. licensing something you don't own. That's why I'm thinking in terms of subscriptions and just that if you're B2C, it's not really that much of a licensing thing. Totally. Yeah, that makes sense. You're synthesizing data that you have fair use to, you're adding value to it, maybe patentable. You have a work product that is not evident from having the raw data. To me, that's the the safer way for my friend Ryan to go and sleep well at night. <laughs> that's important. Yeah, um, no, I appreciate oh, that. Yeah, I I, well that's how I...